All right. Well, welcome to another edition to the Get It Done podcast, where we talk about books, business, and branding for authors. Guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to this particular author. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Elliott, and he is the author of Restoring Jesus, A Fresh Look at Ancient Pro- Pro- uh, excuse me, Prophecies, Divine Signs, and Eyewitness Testimonies. Dr. Elliott, how are you today? I am doing fantastic. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for, you know, taking time out of your day to, you know, speak with us and to the listeners. Um, I want you to, you know, introduce yourself and then go ahead and, you know, talk a little bit about your book. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. It's a, it's a great honor. It is. I really appreciate it. I have uh, started out life as a, an engineer. Uh, For my first 20 years, I worked as an electrical engineer for such companies as Texas Instruments and Boeing and Honeywell. Uh, And during that time, God called me into the ministry, and I spent uh, 22 years as uh, a minister. And um, and now I work with uh, the John Maxwell uh, leadership team, and I do some coaching and training for church staff. And, um, and then uh, I write as well. And I've written a book that uh, the Lord really laid on my heart. It was something that has concerned me for, for quite a bit of time. I feel like there is a false image of who Jesus really is out in the world today. That's created by media and academia. And uh, I talked with people in, in the pews. Uh, who had children and grandchildren who had left the faith, they left the church, and they were very concerned about them. And the more I talked to them, the more I realized that um, our young people were receiving this information about Jesus that was false from the world, and the people in the church did not have the information they needed to answer the questions that a lot of our young people have about Jesus. So I wrote this book to give them the tools they need to help to explain who Jesus is according to the Bible. Uh, if If you think about it, the apostles, why did they believe Jesus? He, he really wasn't anybody in leadership at that time. He was a carpenter from, um, just a regular little town, and yet he comes on the scene, and all of these people are following him. His apostles just believe in him to the point they're willing to die for that. Yeah. Why? And the Bible gives us those answers. And so that's what the book does, is it goes through uh, each of the Gospels and looks for why did the apostles believe that Jesus was God? <clears throat> You brought up a good point because you said, uh, you know, the people who've left the church and they get the information from the media and the world, but, you know, everyone else, but I guess the actual church. So do you feel as if we as the body of Christ, um, you know, we aren't doing a good job of answering these questions that they may have? Or why do you, what's the reason why, you know, they are finding or getting this information from the world and not actually within the body of Christ? I think a lot of, focus within many churches are uh, has moved away from kind of the supernatural aspect of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. We don't really look at uh, all of the prophecies of the coming Messiah, the the first coming. We like to talk about the second coming of Jesus, but really we don't talk that much about the first coming of Jesus. There was a lot of prophecies that he fulfilled And in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew deals with several of those prophecies. His book, his gospel has more uh, prophecy fulfillment than any other gospel. Uh, And then we look at the Gospel of John. And John specifically picked out seven miracles that Jesus did that kind of covers the whole gamut of uh, God's authority and power. Uh, that on, things that only God can do that Jesus did. And John says, I wrote these so that you would know that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is God. Uh, he says he specifically picked out these seven miracles for that purpose. And a lot of times we don't like 
to, you know, really delve into the fact that the miracles that Jesus performed prove he was God. We just don't kind of deal with that in churches. Definitely. Um, I actually saw when you said, you know, talk about that, you know, Jesus and it proves that Jesus is real. Um, so later in your book, it goes on to talk about how people refute that Jesus was real. And I liked, you know, the debate about December 25th um, about his birthday. Some say that, you know, we can't know the exact date of his birth, but yet the Bible doesn't state it um, that, you know, it's some, not anything wrong with celebrating on December 25th, but you go on and to explain, you know, and you lay out the facts and different things, a timeline about how his birth is actually, you know, around or near December 25th. Um, why do you think, you know, so is so much debate around the actual date of his birth? Honestly, I believe that Satan wants to cast as much doubt on whether Jesus even really existed, so that people will not look at him, but will turn away and turn to the world. And so I believe that uh, the whole attack on Christmas is, is part of that. Mm -hmm. um, trying to say, well, we don't know when Jesus was born, and, and we really don't, and, and I acknowledge that in the book. And what I do with December 25th is I kind of use that as a, um, I talk about the possibility of him being born on the 25th, because there is evidence that it, it could have been that or around that date. Um, but uh, I use that to try to point out that uh, whether it was December 25th or April 7th or something like that, you know, whatever date it was, it would still be attacked. And the reason it's being attacked is because uh, the world and especially in the spiritual realm, do not want people to think Jesus is a real historical figure. And the more we can push Jesus to the margins, the more we can kind of get him out of eyesight, the more people can be distracted away from Jesus. And uh, I, I've always been very concerned with why during the largest holiday celebration of the world, literally around the world, more people celebrate Christmas than any other holiday. Wow. Uh, why we have such vicious media attention to try to uh, uh, say that Jesus didn't even exist. I, I read articles every year about how well there's no historical evidence that Jesus even existed. And yet, Outside of the Bible, there are documents that talk about Jesus of Nazareth. Definitely. Um, within your book, I mean, it's funny how you could hear stuff, but then someone else can say it, or they may say it a different way, and it's just like, oh my gosh, like a light bulb go, goes off. <laughs> um, you brought up in your book how, you know, there were so many babies that died um, around the time that Jesus was born. And, you know, I heard before, heard the story, but it's just like pointing out that particular fact. Um, and then go on to now where we have so much debate around, you know, Christmas. And I remember, you know, them wanting to take away Christ out of uh, Christmas and just wanted, I guess, I don't know, holiday. I can't remember the, the name they wanted to be, but they wanted to take out Christ around Christmas. I mean, why do you think, you know, Christians um, are, you know, attacked? so much for their belief i mean and it this has you know isn't something recent like once again it started with you know even before christ got here so i mean why do you think that you know our faith is under so much attack um just for being you know for the sake of christ yeah i believe i believe it is a uh, i'm not looking at it as a conspiracy theory of man i believe that it is a conspiracy of uh, spiritual darkness. I believe that Satan is out to try to destroy Christianity, try to keep people from coming to Jesus. Yeah. And so I believe that's, that, that's all part of it, uh, just a kind of a piece of the overall spiritual uh, um, warfare that we go through, you know. And, and like you said, it was, it's uh, happened with the Jews as well. You go back, you look at their history, you look at them in the Old Testament, there was constant uh, kind of spiritual attack on them. And I believe that over the years, Satan has used pretty much the same tactics to try to 
just divert people's attention away from Jesus Christ. Definitely. Um, and just to piggyback before when you said, you know, in the process of writing this book, you know, you talked to a lot of belief, um, people that have left the church. Um, was there, you know, one, maybe two things that stood out um, as to why they've left the church? When I, when it's younger people, it seems to be the idea that science has disproved much of the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it affects not just the young people, but uh, uh, the older people as well. In fact, I was a, a pastor that I coached. I was talking with him. He was telling me about how one of their spiritual leaders within the church came to him and said, I'm thinking about leaving the church. Yeah. And his reason was his son had sat down. They'd had several uh, conversations about how science had disproved this aspect of the Bible or this aspect of the Bible and uh, this particular spiritual leader within the church uh, was not even sure Jesus actually physically walked this earth, that he was historical. And it was because of his son's encounter with um, online materials, videos, that type of books that uh, suggested that science had disproved most of the Bible. Which, which really is not true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that's a prime example of, you know, the last days where people will be deceived. Um, and also, it talks about in your book about, you know, John the Baptist, his role as an announcer or for, forerunner with the message of, you know, spiritual preparation. You know, mm -hmm. as the body of Christ, do you think that we are doing a good job of not only preparing ourselves, but for the world, for the second coming of Jesus? No, I really don't. Mm -hmm. Now, honestly, you know, Jesus said that when, when he returned, he said, will there be faith on the earth? Mm -hmm. He said that the hearts of many will grow cold because of the increase of, uh, of wickedness and sin in the world. And I see that in, uh, a lot of Christians, they, they get discouraged. They're getting uh, discouraged because they feel like the church is, is dying. Attendance in their particular church is dropping off. They see a lot of their either children or grandchildren or friends that have left the church, and they get very discouraged about all of that. And, and I, I believe that's going to just continue to happen basically up until the time Christ returns. I, I believe that literally right around the corner. But uh, there, there is, um, uh, I think, a lot, of, a lot of discouragement within the church because of that. Now, as far as the church doing a good job, I think a lot of people, a lot more people today are biblically illiterate. I was <laughs> talking with a lady who was, uh, she's a senior citizen. She shared with me that she'd always read her Bible when she was sitting in a sermon or she read her Sunday school material, but she had never sat down and read through the Bible. Mm -hmm. And because of the pandemic and she wasn't able to go to church, she began reading the New Testament just from the very beginning, read it all the way through. And she said that she, uh, she got so much out of it, so much more than listening to sermons or um, her Sunday school lesson, just reading it straight through. That's all she did. And she said it was, it was wonderful. And she had never done that until she was, you know, in her later years. Definitely believe COVID has really stretched, you know, people in different areas. One, you know, not being able to go out. Two, you know, if you are a believer or you've been doubting your faith, this is either going to kind of make you or break you. Either you're going to pull on Jesus a little bit more or you're perhaps going to get, you know, pulled apart, but hopefully you're getting pulled closer to him. Um, and But when you said how the lady, you know, was illiterate, you know, a lot of people don't read. I remember one time my car broke down, so I just went to the nearest church. Um, and it was amazing. I was amazed at how people... I don't think anyone, it was rare that someone had a Bible. Um, you know, I guess the preacher or the, the man um, of the house, 
gave the word, but no one opened their Bible to look at it. I'm, I'm the type of person I like to write, take notes, go back and study and, you know, look at it. I mean, someone can may say something in the era, not, you know, necessarily purposely deceiving people, but, you know, I like to study the word and it's just amazing how, you know, people can get so dependent upon just the word that is coming forth from the pulpit you know of course the man or the woman um you know should be tell, you know giving the unadulterated word of god but it's very important that you have your own relationship with Christ, that you you know study the word and you know uh build up your own i guess strength because i believe you know scripture and prayer is your own weapon in itself because you know when you are going through things you i mean you can call up your pastor, but he may not, he or she may not be available. And it's going to be the power of your words, of you knowing what's in the word of God to be able to pray and come back the enemy. Um, and I think, or I'm going to ask you this question, because some people that I come across, depending on how they're raised and denomination and all of that, I truly believe that, you know, there are some demonic warfare, demonic, you know, principalities, but some people don't have that concept. It's just, you know, God is good. Everything is good. Do you believe that the reason why people don't take it as serious is one, you know, they don't read the word of God, but I mean the Bible, but it's like, they don't necessarily believe in like, you know, demonic warfare, you know, they just hear the Bible and think of everything good, but you know, there's good and evil. And with that, they don't understand that there are demonic strongholds and demonic ties to things that you do and things that you speak out of your mouth. Do you believe that, you know, people don't take it, I guess, don't have that relationship because they don't take it as serious or see it that way. Like, what is your take on that? I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think a lot of people, they don't realize the spiritual battle that they are in. Mm -hmm. And I believe a lot of that spiritual battle is more about distracting you, you know, getting you distracted with, um, and I know we, we have things we have to do every day. You know, we have work, we have, uh, or we might have school, or we have to eat, we have to, you know, uh, places that we have to go. There's things we have to do just to, to live, to survive, but we can allow those things to become uh, so dominant in our life that we don't pay attention to the spiritual. And it's very easy for um, demonic influences to guide us off to places we really shouldn't go, to uh, distract us. I mean, honestly, as, as bad as sin is, mm -hmm. sometimes I think just ignoring God yes. is as dangerous for us, mm -hmm. you know, because if, if Satan can keep us from digging into God's word, then he doesn't need to have us going out, yeah. you know, doing a lot of sin. I mean, basically ignoring God's word is sin, but I'm, I mean, there's a, uh, you can pretty much live a good life and ignore God throughout all of that. Definitely. Uh, and I think Satan would be just as happy with that. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have to put anything serious or, you know, have an accident, but if he can just distract you from, you know, doing the will of God and just not having you walk in, you know, the will of God and his path, then I mean, Hey, he's already done his job. You're not necessarily living, you know, in the fullness of God and what he has for you. So, yeah. And I think that sometimes we, can make things so hard, you know, like the devil made me do it, or we always blame it, but it could be just as simple as, did you use wisdom when you made that decision? I mean, did you see God? I mean, sometimes we give the, the devil too much power, then it's yep. just like, you just didn't really listen. You made a simple mistake. Don't give the devil power over that. You just admit you're wrong and move on, you know? Um, yeah. let's say, as in our church, you know, say ouch and go with God, you know, just say, repent and move on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, I mean, within your book, what um, would you say is, I guess, the one, one, your one or two favorite parts of the book that you would like people to take away and remember? I think the biggest thing is that if you look at, uh, at Jesus and you're trying to figure out why did the apostles believe in Jesus, why should I believe in Jesus? Uh, because I don't think that our faith is really supposed to be blind. It's not just blind faith. I believe that God gives us so much information within scripture that he's, he is proving, he gives us the proofs. And I think the two biggest proofs for Jesus being God for, is, is the, uh, 
prophecies that he fulfilled in his first coming and the miracles that he performed. Definitely. And uh, that was kind of the idea when I began looking at it. Uh, the, it all started out with a conversation with um, a member of a church years ago that I was having with him. I, we were talking about uh, some of the miracles that Jesus was performing. And I thought, wow, this would be, even then, this would be kind of a great book. And uh, as I went through the years, I started adding to that idea. And the two main things I believe are prophecy and miracles. Those are absolute proofs that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is uh, his divinity. It's an authentication of his divinity. And I gl I'm glad that you said that point, because one of the things I wrote down, which you just pretty much explained, because I like the example of where you said people miss the main point that Jesus turned a lot of water into wine because he was God. You know, some of us, we focus on, oh my gosh, does that mean we could drink wine? You know, does that mean, you know, we can go out here and just have this type of liberty? But I love how you said, we just missed the main point overall that, you know, Jesus did this because he is God. And I just love how you summed it up right there, um, you know, in your, uh, your main takeaway. You know, but where can the listeners find your book? It's available on pretty much every electronic uh, online bookstore, Amazon, of course, Barnes and Noble, all of those. Um, it's, uh, it's, if you're trying to look for the physical book in a, in a bookstore, there's probably not very many of those that are, are out there, uh, but you can definitely get it online. Now, I do have a website for the book, yes. and you can order it through that. And the, the website is simply restoringjesus.com. Awesome. So yeah. definitely. And I have a Facebook page as well. Oh, yeah, go ahead and share that. I was going to, you know, how can we, you know, stay in contact with you? If, you know, someone is really loving, you know, the message that you have here, how can someone stay in contact with you? Yeah, Facebook, um, Facebook page, Restoring Jesus. That's a good way. I do have a Twitter account, uh, which is under my name, uh, Jeffrey Elliott, but uh, um, I, I'm not as good at tweeting as I am with Facebook. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can get in contact with me either way like that. And, and I have had some people ask uh, if I will come to their church and, uh, and speak. And I, I will. Uh, I, I have a Vimeo channel as well as a YouTube channel. So you can find me on both of those. And um, uh, you can get on, in contact with me on the Facebook page if you'd like to have me come to your church. Awesome. So one last question, because the podcast, we talk about books, branding, and business for authors. So from an author standpoint, because we have an, an, an excuse me, I want to say aspiring authors who listen, and, um, you know, what would you say, either you can say what was the hardest thing about publishing this book, or if you had to do it over, what would you do different? Well, I would say, first of all, that writing the book was the easiest part. Oh, it okay. really was. Getting it published and, and then trying to uh, promote it, it has been the most difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the mistakes I made was uh, my wife and I were starting a business at the same time that I was publishing the book. And uh, I did not realize how much time it was going to take to promote the book. Yes. And that has, uh, that has definitely been difficult to do with a new business being started and, and then trying to promote the book. And uh, if I had it to do over again, I would, uh, I would not have those two things occurring at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. I tell people, you know, when you are author, some people just think after I write the book that is over, but that's just where, well, after you publish it, that's just where it begins because if you write it, they won't come. You do have to market it and get it out there to the world, to the masses. Just like, you know, Jesus had a word. He went out here and preached. He encouraged us to go out here and share the gospel all ends of the earth. So just if you have a book, you have to market to get it to the masses. Yes, you well, do. Let me say this also for, for me. Uh, I have been getting into different groups, such as uh, uh, the Facebook group uh, where, where I met you, uh, Christian authors and writers. Yes. And uh, meeting other authors and writers and asking a lot of questions 
And I, I would encourage anybody that's trying to write a book to get into one, as many of those groups as you can, as early as you can, so you can ask all kinds of questions and never be afraid to ask the questions because I've learned so much in, in doing that and it has helped me so much. And, and I, I met you and that was a wonderful thing. I am very uh, appreciative of being able to be on your podcast. Uh, so I encourage any uh, um, writers who are just getting started in the process, get in there, meet other writers, ask them questions, find out about who they published their book, whether they did it with Amazon or whether they did it through um, a more traditional publishing route or something like that for a self-published book and, and ask a lot of questions because there's a lot of price differences between who does the publishing. Yes. They say uh, self-publishing is free, but self-publishing the right way is not free. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh. so there's just a, a lesson out there. But I want to thank you once again. If you want his book, go to restoringjesus.com. The website to stay in connected, you go to the Facebook page, Restoring Jesus. I think Twitter was Jeffrey Elliott. Yeah. Um, all right. So I just want to make sure. And if you're interested in him coming out to speak to your church, maybe virtually or in person, definitely reach out to him. Should they go to restoringjesus.com? Uh, yeah, they can get in contact with me there. Yes. Okay. There's a contact form on that as well. Well, definitely. I want to thank you so much um, for being on the podcast. And I pray many blessings over you, your family, and your ministry, and continue to, you know, share this book and share the gospel and do the work of God. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me on, and, and I pray for blessings on you and your family as well. Well, thank you. You have a great day. You too. <laughs>